When you hear the word extreme or hardcore wrestling, one seems to think Philadelphia and uh, the ECW. Long before the ECW was even <clears throat> on the map, places like Amarillo, Texas with the Funks, Mid-South, uh, Watts Territory, uh, Florida, Championship Wrestling from Florida, Eddie Graham, the Sheik's Detroit Territory, Puerto Rico, um, of course, Memphis. Uh, Memphis was some of the most loyal, diehard fans ever. One of the last territories to actually uh, stay around as long as they did. <clears throat> they were the uh, ones that fought the most. Those fans didn't put up with no shit. They, they stuck together and they stuck with their wrestling uh, all through the Delta region, through Kentucky, Arkansas, M Memphis, west of Memphis. They some fantastic uh, hardcore wrestling down there, which was also the, um, the birthplace for FMW wrestling in Japan, which we're going to uh, touch on a little bit later on. <clears throat> but today, like I said, we're not going through the hardcore history and certain wrestlers. We're going to go through a couple of wrestlers who were uh, responsible for bringing that to light. But we're going to basically cover the magazine covers and some of the uh, interesting uh, gimmick matches of that time that made it to the cover of the magazines. <clears throat> now, the reason I didn't show this magazine on the Sheik's uh, video that I did, um, I, I, for one, I don't really consider Wrestling Life a wrestling magazine. In 1956, there was uh, other magazines out there. Actually, the magazines had just took a small break from 50... Uh, from 51 to 55, they ran a, uh, a full circulation for mass consumption, and then it stopped uh, until 59. So there was a short break with no magazine releases, except for Wrestling Life, which was basically sold out of Chicago uh, and the surrounding area and in the arenas and also mail away. It wasn't a magazine you can go up to any newsstand in any town in any city and grab. Um, but this is the Sheik's, I mentioned this magazine in the Sheik's video, so I'll just show it now. This was considered extreme, this hold right here, which was, you could look at it as and say it's a form of a cobra clutch. Um, in, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, that would be a triangle choke with the arms, it's an arm triangle uh, from the back position rather than your legs. Um, it's a choke. And the, the story of this issue here is not so much on the Sheik, which of course that's the Sheik right there. This is his first magazine cover. Um, it's about the extreme hold that he's using and why the referees are allowing that particular hold to be uh, used and get away with. Um, and the article is, is in this, but it's actually interviewing the referee and why he's allowing the Sheik to get away with these uh, illegal holds that he does. So this was considered hardcore uh, for 1956, a, a choke or a hold like that. And this is before the Sheik became the Sheik. This was the Sheik of Araby. He did some wrestling. Um, well, he did a lot more wrestling than he did later on. Um, but it, it was at this beginning stage is where he was more of a wrestler before he became, you know, a, a madman and, uh, and uh, basically a blood bank of matches. Uh, this is August of 1956, uh, Wrestling Life. The Sheik, of course, I pick him first because he is without a doubt he goes back to 1956 as the innovator of the violent scene in wrestling. And the Sheik uh, is on the cover of February 1966 uh, Wrestling Review. And he's got a foreign object here, stabbing it into the throat of his opponent. Not sure who he's with. The story is mostly about the Sheik and his rule-breaking maniac on the mat. Um, so as you see the Sheik early, he was the first to come out with the objects. He was the first to come out in the in the, the gimmick tree matches, uh, such as chains, uh, cages, stuff like that. Uh, started in 56 with his first just being a hold. Uh, now 10 years later, he is on the cover of Wrestling Review with a foreign object. We're not in any particular order. We're gonna kind of just go through these as, you know, I have it somewhat paragraphed off, I guess, if you want to say, but uh, you'll see as you go. It, it's going to be kind of all over the place. Um, the Sheik now in 1972 uh, with just an extremely bloody face, bloody cover uh, here against Bobo Brazil in a ch with a chain across the throat. It could be a chain match. Uh, who knows? They did start around the 72 uh, time period, the chain matches, and we have a couple other issues that show that. Uh, again, the Sheik on the cover in 1973, just a bloody mess now, far from what the Sheik was in 1956, more of a, uh, you know, a lot of people say the Sheik didn't wrestle. He did wrestle. Uh, he did have wrestling matches. He did have a wrestling background, but, you know, not like later on where he would hardly do anything but maybe, you know, a headlock and a throw, and that would be the extent of his match. Um, the Sheik now again on the cover of Wrestling Review with um, uh, Mark Lewin, and this is a, uh, 
um, this is a rare uh, Wrestling Review magazine book. Uh, they put out a series of these uh, a, f a few years ago, I think in two thousand. Well, it was probably more than a few years ago. Probably about twenty years ago now, two thousand three, maybe. Um, I might be wrong around that time period. Uh, they put out maybe five or six wrestling review magazines and they turned them into a book. So they grabbed maybe five or six issues and then they made a, a book out of it. Um, it's not very thick. It's just mostly, you know, pages from the back of the day of from when it was in the magazines and they just made it to like a, a book type thing with the Sheik. Pretty good. They're hard to find. They're kind of expensive. I have, I think, four volumes, but I just thought that would be a crazy cover to show. That was never on an actual magazine cover, that shot. Uh, here's a Sheik again in 1974, and he's uh, throwing fire. Again, uh, very tame compared to today, but you know, in the early 1970s, people weren't doing shit like that. Okay, uh, This is on the cover of Wrestling Sports Stars, 1974. Sheik on the cover um, with uh, Dory Funk Sr. now biting the forehead. Um, Freddie Blassie was also known for biting, uh, but the Sheik, of course, brought it to, to fame, uh, biting people's heads and causing them to bleed, uh, you know, far cry from an actual wrestling maneuver, uh, biting someone's forehead. Um, here's the Sheik in 1974, Papera Farpo in a cage match. Uh, you can see the different matches that he's getting involved with, with the weaponry and also uh, the uh, the weapons that he's um, and the different matches that he's doing 1975 June wrestling review he's driving the uh, the spike into Don Leo Jonathan's forehead now <clears throat> again with that spike on big book of wrestling September 1977 and a very bloodied uh, Sheik you can find out a lot more of the Sheik and the Sheik video that I did but it's important to to show the Sheik for wh what he's done and how he's responsible uh, for the start of the extreme hardcore style of wrestling uh, by being the first guy in 1956 to to you know do something so controversial and it happens to be you know nothing more than a simple hold because in 1956 those holds weren't allowed and they were taken serious. <clears throat> Here's the Sheik on the cover with uh, Dick the Bruiser. Dick the Bruiser and the Sheik had some tremendous battles, especially at the battle through territories, through, uh, through Detroit and Indianapolis. Um, great bloody shot of both of these guys in early 1970. I'm trying to see the date here. I think it's 74, but there's no number. Uh, yeah, on the bottom, sorry. November of 1974, the Sheik. Um, best friend and also Ben Adversary, which would be the Abdul the Butcher. And here he is on the cover of a gong issue in 1975 uh, with Abdul. Very bloodied up cover. Uh, very uh, hardcore for that time period, especially uh, in Japan. They didn't show very many bloody matches like this in Japan. And here comes my boy Jimmy. All right, bud, take a hike, pal. So it gets us to October 1969. Uh, and it's got... The Chain Gang versus the Hell's Angels. And um, there's some pretty cool uh, uh, matches for that time period. If you look at their clothes, wrestlers didn't dress like that to the ring. Uh, these guys did. They came in with almost looking like the jeans material. Uh, it was wrestling trunks, though. And they had, you know, big boots on and the biker boots. Um, the, the clothing that they wore, the, they wore shirts into the ring. No one wore shirts in the ring back then. Uh, you always had your, you know, your towel, your robe, and your trunks, and uh, that was it. And these guys kind of were trendsetting at that time period. So of course, that's Fargo, and he would be wrestling for the next 45 years, uh, going from, from phase to phase and keeping his gimmick alive with many different, uh, uh, different um personas throughout the years that kept his name relevant for sure. Uh, but the reason for the magazine is this is the very first issue that is showing a steel cage match. And on the bottom here is San Martino and the Sheik in a cage. And that's a small, very small, hardly noticeable shot of the cage inside. We open it up <clears throat> inside and you got your first uh, look at Bruno and the Sheik in the Boston Garden. I believe it's the Boston Garden. It's Boston. I'm guessing it's the Garden. Um, uh, inside of a steel cage. This is your first look at that inside of the magazine. And then here is just another shot of the cage of Bruno and the Sheik. And you can see them. The, the fence is a lot different than you see. I want to say today. I don't know what today's matches look like. I haven't seen a cage match in years. But uh, this was a more of like a, a chicken wire fence uh, a coop type of, of cage. Different than your steel fence. But uh, early steel cages in wrestling look just like that. 
Speaking of uh, Memphis earlier, here's Jerry Jarrett um, on your very first scaffold match in 1971 on the cover of Boxing Wrestling Monthly. And let's just go inside the magazine. Comes with a poster as well. Uh, here is Jarrett on top of that scaffold. And here he is hanging off the bottom of the scaffold. A lot of people think it was the skyscrapers with the road, not the skyscrapers, um, the road warriors and the uh, Midnight Express uh, on the scaffold match in Starcade 86. But Jerry Jarrett, looking a lot like Jeff there with the hands up, uh, was the first to do the scaffold match. And they give you a pull out poster that I accidentally pulled out a few years back. So I may as well just show the poster that they give you. You see Jarrett hanging uh, from the bottom of that scaffold. And there it is, your first scaffold match, 1971. Our magazines barely even touched on it. I think there was a small mention of it in one of the magazines, but certainly no coverage of it on a cover of a magazine. <clears throat> Here is your first chair outside the ring chair shot. And um, this is Wrestling Annual 1974. Tremendous bloody battles in, Lo in the Los Angeles, uh, California territory with um, uh, Victor Rivera and John Tolos. And these are your two men here. Getting the chair shot outside the ring is John Tolos for the first time on a magazine looking at a chair shot, 1974. Chain matches were kind of popular in the early 70s. That was like one of the ones that was more popular, more popular than the cage. Cages got more popular later on, but it was usually like a, ch a chain match or a strap match. And this is the first issue covering a chain match, uh, May of 1972. Uh, bloody battle, again, Tennessee, right? Right, right down in the, uh, the Delta region, the Memphis area, uh, hardcore wrestling. Uh, you got a chain match, you got um, a scaffold match right off the bat in the early 70s on the cover of these magazines, Wrestling Monthly, May of 72. And uh, another part of a chain match here, he's hung from the side, uh, uh, bloodbath of the year, 27 falls, one hour, 44 minutes of gory terror. You also got the blackjacks in the corner here with uh, Bobby Heenan, who's a bloody mess. And we're gonna look at Bobby Heenan a little bit later on too, as a great leader that he was, he made it to a cover of a lot of issues. Another chain match here on the cover of The Wrestler, January, 1974. Let's go back a little bit to 1969, and we're going to take a look at Freddie Blassie. Freddie Blassie, known by many as the Hollywood fashion plate, as, you know, a wrestler, or an old-timer, or a manager for some people, uh, including myself, because I was, he was a manager um, at my early, uh, early preteen years. He was just the wrestling manager. Um, he was known as the Vampire. Uh, in Japan. Hello, Jimi Hendrix. Take a hike, bud. Uh, he was known as the vampire for the bloody matches that he would be being involved with. Uh, the Japanese would <laughs> beat it, dude. He would, um, they, they forced him to put on a muzzle uh, if he was going to wrestle because he'd be biting everybody. Uh, Freddie Blassie was a, a mean rule breaker, hardcore wrestler, uh, and bled buckets, and he's on a bunch of magazines, uh, bloodied up. Here's just the open shot inside the magazine with him with that muzzle on, uh, kind of funny looking. Sabu, you know, brought it to light later on in the ECW, but Freddie Blassie was the first. Um, I think I have another picture of it somewhere. Uh, this is a pretty rare magazine, and it's these early wrestlers are hard to find. And it's just a shot of Freddie here uh, before his match with Bobo Brazil. That's the signing of the contract with Jules Strombo. And he agreed to wear the muzzle. So Freddie Blassie, known as a fighter, as a hardcore wrestler, also had some battles with uh, the Sheik. And here he is on the cover of August the 69, getting the spike into the head by the Sheik. A very bloody Freddie Blassie on the bottom of October 1970, and he's just drenched in blood from head to toe. I don't think I've ever seen anyone bloodier than that. This would be the issue, him versus John Tolos uh, in the chain match uh, in, um, in Los Angeles that gave him the nickname as the Vampire, and he is biting the forehead of this uh, very rare issue of Wrestling Review, March of 1971. I don't know how much it sells for now. I seen it for $125 on eBay. I was like, what? 
um, please do not pay anything like that. I mean, you should be able to find it for about $25 from somebody else. Um, I've seen it for $70, $50. Uh, it's crazy. I don't know why it demands so much money. But for some reason, I guess sellers are getting that. Um, November 1971, another bloody shot of Blassie talking about the feud with John Tolis. And once again, April of 1972, Blassie is on a cover now with uh, the Sheik. Sheik is involved in another cage match. This will be uh, the second cage match cover, the better one of the two for the Sheik. Again, you can get a better view of that fence, the, the, the wire, the um, chicken type wire uh, fencing for the steel cage match. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen a match like that. I'd never bother looking one up if I would like it or not. I should actually check it out and see if I can find a match online like that. <clears throat> and once again, Blassie on the cover of Big Book of Wrestling. The sickening horror of blood uh, of horror of blood matches. This is issue covers a lot of the bloody matches throughout the professional wrestling. Uh, and it's got the um, uh, different stories for the uh, names escaping me. Um, Bulldog Brower uh, on the bottom and uh, Freddie Blassie on the top. <clears throat> Two guys who you don't think of as hardcore, but they very much were, uh, were the Crusher and the Bruiser both. Both as a tag team, they were like the Road Warriors before the Road Warriors, beating everybody up, kicking the shit out of everybody. Uh, in singles matches, they were also world champions <clears throat> and also uh, 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 bl uh, extreme hardcore matches and bloody. They were known for some of the bloodiest matches uh, in the late 60s and in the early 70s. Uh, so let's take a look at the Crusher and the Bruiser both. You'll see them as a tag team and also uh, individually. <clears throat> Here is the Crusher on his first bloody cover of June 1962. And he's on there with uh, Fargo. Um, this is also a Stanley Weston issue from Wrestling Review. Stanley's early reviews uh, hold up really well. Very good magazines. I like them. Uh, this is another one that goes on the more expensive side. Um, it's just, I, uh, I can't say enough about the early wrestling reviews. That and Wrestling World were the best. I prefer Wrestling World in the 60s, but early Wrestling Review was right there. I mean, it was some excellent photography for that time period. Crusher and the Bruiser on the cover of a Japanese issue. Uh, that's the Crusher's uh, face gushing blood. The Bruiser here with no teeth. I mean, just look at those those mugs on the cover, 1976. Crusher once again, bloodbath in Chicago, March of 72. Another issue that runs on the pretty expensive side. Great shot. This used to scare the shit out of me as a kid when I looked at this. I was like, what the hell? You, you didn't know what was going on. I mean, if you think wrestling wasn't real and you look at a cover like this, it's just like it puts the fear in you. It makes you guess, you know. Um, this is the bruiser. They look so much alike, especially when they were bloodied up. Sometimes you can, but you can tell by the teeth. Uh, bruiser has no teeth. And I mean, here his hair is a mess. The blood smeared all over his face. He's got no teeth in his mouth. And he looks like he's missing his eye. I mean, look at this cover. Unbelievable. Um, <laughs> January 1975, Inside Wrestling. Also, the war with Sweet Hansen turning on his partner, Rip Hawk, when those two broke up as a tag team, also had some extreme bloody battles as well. <clears throat> Here is the Bruiser in Japan, and uh, a bloodied up Anoki in a, uh, in a, with a rope wrapped around his neck. Now, the, the Baba is known for sticking to the sport of professional wrestling, and uh, not so much the crazy brawling, um, but even Baba was down for brawling back in the 60s and early 70s. And uh, here he is with a great shot. Both guys bloodied up. Excellent cover, uh, excellent magazine cover of uh, Pro Wrestling Monthly in Japan. Another shot of Pro Wrestling Monthly with the Bruiser. Also, Bloody Steel Cage match 1973. Great coverage of the blood and also the steel cage inside this issue. First time you get to see a cage in color other than a cover inside the magazine, you're getting it with uh, the Japanese issues, which were excellent for that time period. <clears throat> Let's take a look. And there we got uh, the uh, Bruiser once again with Bobby Heenan. They had some battles, of course, throughout the years in his territory, uh, the WWA in Indianapolis. And Bobby, was that a doubt? One of the best bleeders as a manager, for sure. Um, he was on several soaked bloodbath issues um, 
early on in his career, and let's take a look at one of them, the wrestler in 1970. Uh, this is when he was in a match. He bled when he was a manager. He bled during a match. Uh, he, it didn't matter if Bobby was gushing. Here he is during, uh, this was after him being a manager. He didn't even wrestle in this match. Um, this is another issue that goes for a hell of a lot of money. Um, my God, Bobby, what happened to your face? September 1970, and it's just nothing but a gore fest on the cover. Uh, something that was certainly frightened moms, for sure. Great looking issue of Bobby Heenan. <clears throat> uh, Bobby on the cover again, December 1973, The Wrestler. This photo would be used several times throughout the circulation in the early 70s, up to 75 or so. Um, I wanted to get all of them signed by Bobby. I didn't get a chance to get that last one signed, which I was upset. Um, but uh, the next couple I have uh, Bobby like this were signed uh, early uh, issues that he had. I wish I had gotten that 1970 issue signed by him. That would have been great. Um, <clears throat> Bobby, again, with Baron Von Raschke. This is part of him in a, uh, in a tag team. This is June 1972, uh, Inside Wrestling. Also, uh, the late Bobby Shane uh, as the champion in the far left. Bobby on the cover of Wrestling News in 73. Um, there was something about this I wanted to say. It's, um, it's escaping me now. Uh, anyway, uh, Wrestling News, AWA edition. Uh, it also had the Indianapolis coverage from the Dick the Bruiser's territory. And uh, Bobby the Brain, uh, Heenan, bloodied up. Wrestling News, 1973. Uh, the April 75, again, Bobby Heenan. It's another one of those photos. This was my very first magazine um, ever. This is my first issue that I got in 1977. This was the issue that started it all and never stopped. Still going today. And uh, this for always will be my, my favorite uh, just for that reason. April of 1975, Inside Wrestling. And I remember looking through this thinking, oh, my God, this guy must be dead. There's no way he's alive. You know, when you're seven years old looking at that, you're just thinking, like, there's no way. Right? Um, August 71, again, Bobby Heenan on the cover with the Baron. Bobby here in the corner in the ring during the match. Uh, August 71, the wrestler <clears throat> and wrapping it up with the, this recycled photo this is a little bit different same photo but a different angle I, it's coming uh, it's hard to explain i could tell you more in detail but who cares december of 72 uh the wrestler bobby heenan again a bloody face and also the mummy in the corner here captain lou albano also known as a as a juicer for sure and uh even exposing himself at times he would do it so much um especially i guess after a few pops he would bleed even better and uh probably the bloodiest magazine cover of all time i would say uh is this one uh, if not the top two or three because there's not many other ones that are that bloody than this um if 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 it, there is another one i have it i just I haven't seen it to be any bloodier than this one in my opinion july of 75 uh, official wrestling with captain lou uh with a mess on his face <clears throat> terry funk of course we just talked about terry funk in another magazine uh, for his uh, career and the rise of Terry Funk. And this is uh, another look at him now for the extreme hardcore icon that he'd become. Uh, Terry, Terry could be a, a terrific mat wrestler. He could be a fantastic cage wrestler. He could be a fantastic uh, barbed wire wrestler, extreme uh, dynamite blowing up wrestler, you name it. Terry Funk can sell it. Terry Funk could do it. He should be in the running as one of the top five wrestlers of all time for the things that he's done in wrestling and never, ever had been the same match twice. I mean, you know, you, you can put him with Lou Thez and he'll have a mat match and then you put him with the Sheik and he'll be uh, gushing blood and moving furniture and, and, and throwing people through tables and chairs. And then he'll come back uh, two weeks later in a tag team match with his brother in Japan and win the Japan Cup. I mean, the guy did it all. The guy uh, should be... Um, known for his wrestling ability and his ability to adapt uh, over anything else. And he just kind of gets swallowed up and drowned in the hardcore. Um, but, but he was so much more than that. And also Bobby Heenan on the bottom of there getting bloody. Another shot of Terry again, uh, a bloody mess in September of 72 inside wrestling. Also him here in a chain match. And we're going to look a few of his chain matches now with uh, Boris Malenko. Thank you to the friends of the channel for filling me in on who that was on the bottom. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, a, a chain match when it was attached to the wrist. They had the dog collar matches when they're around the, th the neck, but these matches were around the wrist. 
the same match, different magazine cover, December of 1972, uh, Funk and Malenko. <clears throat> Funk also going to war a lot with um, Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes on the cover with uh, Funk in a bull rope match, of course. Dusty Rhodes should also be hailed as a hardcore innovator, hardcore icon for, the, for being a baby face and bleeding the buckets of blood for miles across the country with everybody he was in the ring with. Um, without a doubt, one of the original hardcores for sure. I'm gonna take a look at a few here with Dusty Rhodes. April 83 with Ernie Ladd in a bull rope match. He was in a series of bull rope matches and we're gonna look at them. Dusty, again, with the Mongolian Stomper in 76 in a bull rope match, wrestling monthly. <clears throat> Mark, Maniac, Mark Lewin, bull rope match. Uh, bull rope of Texas bull rope, it says, a bloody a terror of the bloody Texas bull rope, June of 1979, Dusty and Mark Lewin. <clears throat> he battled for the WWF championship in a bull rope match with superstar Billy Graham, January of 79. Also a strap match, winter of 77, wrestling's greatest battles with Superstar. <clears throat> Back with Superstar on the cover and the bull rope of the hanging in February of 1978. He would go on to barbed wire matches with Tully Blanchard in the Crockett NWA territory in the uh, mid part of the 80s. <clears throat> would have several battles with him throughout the Great American Bashes and the Barbed Wire. And just on any given Sunday against Ric Flair, he'd be a bucket of blood. <laughs> and here he is with, who knows, with whatever match of the hundreds that they had with Flair, there were bloody battles. This is one extreme uh, butcher job on the cover of Wrestling Scene. If it wasn't for Ab guys like Abdul the Butcher and, uh, and Carlos Colon, I don't think Wrestling Scene would have existed because it took guys like that to keep this magazine in publication. They were known for their bloody extreme coverage. <clears throat> wrestling Scene again with Flair and Dusty. Again, uh, hardcore icon. The guy could do it all, wrestle for a big man and also with the gimmicks and bled great, looked great as a bloody mess. Fans loved him. Fans loved to boo him when he was bad. They loved cheering him when he was good. He wasn't very bad very often. <clears throat> Here he is with Kevin Sullivan uh, in Florida territory, uh, the wrestling scene. Again, with the barbed wire bunkhouse match with Tully Blanchard sticking his, the tip of his boot in his mouth. What a shot that is on the cover of ringside. Here's a guy that you may not know much about as being a hardcore wrestler. Hardcore wrestler doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a tables and chairs and you're getting smashed over the head uh, with a beer bottle. Um, hardcore wrestler is somebody who gives it their all and, and gives it 100% and makes the match as best as they can for the price you pay for your ticket and, and, and sells it whether it's there's eight people in the crowd or there's a sellout arena of 25,000, and Dick Murdoch uh, would certainly do that every single time. Dick Murdoch, excellent bleeder. He, him and Killer Carl Cox were in a, one of my all-time favorite match, bloody matches uh, of all time, which took place in all Japan in 1976. And I was just talking about it um, uh, with Eric Kay on, on the uh, friend of the channel here uh, about how that match always stayed in my head. That the punches that these two threw, uh, they, they they looked like they went through a, you know a 15 round fight. The way they were punching and selling those punches, two of the best punch throwers ever, Dick Murdoch and Killer Carl Cox. Uh, every fan or wrestler who wants to break into the business should watch that match and learn how to punch and sell from watching those two. Uh, great bloody bout. I mean, I haven't watched it in years. That's This is how I'm remembering it because it was some of the earlier bloody matches I used to get from the tape trade days. And uh, uh, Old Japan, 76, Cox and Murdoch. Uh, I'm gonna have to look, I have it on DVD. I'm sure, I don't know if it's online or not. Uh, if it is, try to look for it. It was a, a great match, a great bloody bout. Two out of three falls. I forget, there was a disqualification somehow, but uh, one of my favorites, and Dick Murdoch for sure, uh, gets my respect as a hardcore wrestler. He did everything everywhere, <clears throat> and here he is some 15 years later in a barbed wire match with Dr. Death Williams on the cover of Gold Belt Wrestling, uh, April of 1988. <clears throat> Dick died. He's one of those guys 
who, who was, you know, 25 years old. He looked like he was 60, and I don't even think he made it till he was 50 in, in years. I think he died in his late 40s. Um, he just had that look, you know, the, a, a kick-ass beer-drinking guy who just got off the bar stool, um, the guy that you, you know, you're, you're a construction worker with, your truck driver with, and he's just your normal everyday guy who, who has that normal look and just would kick the shit out of you. Um, that, that was just his, you know, he reminded me of, like, you know, guys that my father who were steel workers um, hung with at work. It was just a you know, big, rugged, tough guy, drank beer and fought. And that's what, that's what Dick Murdoch reminded me of, and that's how I, that's how I thought of him every time I watched him in a wrestling match. <clears throat> Abdul the Butcher, of course, goes without any kind of introduction. Um, Carlos Colon, for that matter, the same. Two original hardcore uh, icons. Carlos Colon, of course, runs the territory in Puerto Rico, and uh, that place paved the way for hardcore, without a doubt. Uh, some of the matches and the blood that were spilled in Puerto Rico uh, are, are just legendary, and these are two of the best at that uh, on this cover of Wrestling Scene. Um, I'm sorry, there's no date on it. Um, Wrestling Scene's the worst for presenting their dates and months. It's inside the magazine somewhere. I'm gonna say it's 87 sometime. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Championship Wrestling, uh, Mulligan and uh, Abdullah. This was a match from Championship Wrestling from Florida, May of 1987, and it's at towards the end of Blackjack Mulligan's career, who was also another kick-ass, hardcore, stick-carrying Texan who kicked the shit out of you. Abdullah now on the cover with Dusty Rhodes sticking the foreign object into the eye. It's been a while since we've seen a cover like that, early 60s. I'm sorry, late 60s, early 70s, you'd see the Sheik do it, and then it kind of disappeared, and then here it is again. Um, February of 1984, Inside Wrestling with an old school hardcore shot of sticking the, uh, the, the uh, spike uh, into the eye of Dusty Rhodes, uh, again, in the Florida Territory. <clears throat> NWA Crockett, Mid-Atlantic, um, Abdullah would battle with uh, Manny Fernandez, another fantastic wrestler who could mix it up, fight well had great in the ring hardcore style or wrestling style Manny Fernandez guy had was uh, had it all never really went too too far with uh, his career as in being famous with the big companies but um, throughout the country he was a hardcore wrestler and stayed with it and had my respect I got to meet the guy and it was a hell of a nice dude very very friendly talk to you answer all your questions very very cool down-to-earth guy was Manny Fernandez um, here he is on the cover uh, getting the spike again from Abdullah in January of 1986 and my heater is kicking on non-stop it's like zero degrees here in New York so I hope that you guys can still hear me without this background noise. Um, Abdullah again with Mulligan, who we just seen not too long ago uh, on the wrestling scene on All Star Wrestling in April, um, February 1984. Abdullah again, wrestling scene with um, Buzz Sawyer, Bloody Mess. <clears throat> Abdullah with Mike Rotundo on the cover, uh, Ringside Wrestling. Tony Atlas, a bloody mess with Abdul with a butcher wrestling scene. And finishing it off the American issues with Abdullah and uh, Carlos Colon once again, some years later on in Puerto Rico. Abdullah, a big name in Japan, all Japan uh, mostly, and um, <clears throat> early shot of him on the cover in 1975, October, a complete bloody mess. Abdullah once again, uh, 1975, on the cover, bloody mess, great shot, great looking forehead shot, the road map on his head. <clears throat> Let's take a look at another unsung hero of the hardcore wrestling style. No, it's not Ric Flair, Wahoo McDaniel. Wahoo McDaniel played football for the, uh, for the Jets, linebacker, big tough guy. Didn't put up with any shit, with any promoter. Went from territory to territory, wherever he went. He always held a championship. He was heel, he was face, and he was rugged to the, to the very end. <clears throat> 1979 match with Ric Flair in an Indian strap match. Bloodied up uh, Wahoo McDaniel. Guy, I loved him wherever he went. Uh, even his final years in the AWA, uh, you know, usually Indian gimmick guys, we were like, you know, usually they were kind of stupid or they, they you know, 
to overplay their gimmick a little bit too much, but not Wahoo. And Wahoo was in there as a heel, uh, and you didn't see that as a heel usually with a, like an Indian wrestler. You're usually a good guy. A bad guy would be the cowboy or something like that. Um, uh, but uh, Wahoo really, you know, took it to a different level. Uh, always had a great bloody bout. Uh, always with a gimmick match early on in 1974 October. Uh, bloodbath battle uh, in the dressing room. Wahoo on the cover of the wrestler. Wahoo wrestling Ric Flair at the uh, Battle of the Belts in Florida, January 1985, Sports Review. Wahoo responsible for bringing up Tully Blanchard and putting him over in Southwest Championship Wrestling and also Crockett Territory. Also as a tag team, they worked together as well uh, and friends uh, and then also against each other for sure uh, on the cover of Wrestling Scene of the bloody Tully Blanchard and Wahoo. Wahoo also helped develop and put over for his first title in championship wrestling from Florida, Lex Luger, which was the Southern Heavyweight Championship, and uh, spilling blood for a young Lex Luger in his rookie year in May of 86, championship wrestling. Another great shot of Lex Luger and Wahoo on the cover of Wrestling Action. Wahoo battling it out with Abdullah the Butcher, sticking his fingers into the gouges of Abdullah's head. I'm sure that was all would, it would take to make Abdullah split wide open. His head was so scarred. And again, driving in the cover, uh, the, the foreign object into the head of Abdullah on the cover. Uh, vampires are taking over wrestling winter uh, 1987 of the Wrestler Annual. Great shot of uh, Wahoo jamming the uh, spike into Abdullah's head. And this would be Ab uh, Wahoo's last wrestling magazine cover, he would retire maybe some eight to ten months after this uh, run with um, <clears throat> Jimmy Garvin. I mean, look, he's on the cover with Jimmy Garvin. He's bleeding. Who the fuck bleeds for Jimmy Garvin? I don't think anyone ever bled for Jimmy Garvin. Uh, Wahoo's doing it, man. Battling it out uh, with Jimmy Garvin. Uh, blood pouring down his face, all down Jimmy's arm. He is gushed in this issue of uh, Wrestling Fury. Gimmick match. The Hell in a Cell, which I've never seen one. Um, I mean, it's the cause of my own ignorance because I refuse to turn on the WWF. I refuse to watch anything that he, McMahon, put out for, you know, my personal uh, reasons of, of hating his guts for what he did to the sport of my professional wrestling as a kid. So I refuse to see anything he's ever done or any of the wrestlers, for that matter. I will not watch any of them. Um, but this was your original uh, Hell in a Cell, only from what I hear people say and talk about the Hell in a Cell. I never watched it, but this was your Four Sides of Steel with the, the roof on the top, the last battle of Atlanta. Uh, Tommy Wildfire Rich and Buzz Sawyer would battle uh, in the last battle of Atlanta, and this would be a one-time only match, and uh, the cage was something. I have it on DVD. I, it was on YouTube a long time ago. I don't know if it still is. It was on there without commentary. The whole match is without commentary because it wasn't shot for television. Um, great bloody battle. Uh, the original uh, cell. And this was, was, for this time period, it was something to look at. Buzz Sawyer and uh, Tommy Rich bled buckets in their feud. And here's just a, another one. Um, they, they were bloodied all over Georgia. Uh, this is Inside Wrestling, May 1983. <clears throat> Joe LaDuke on the cover of uh, uh, Sports Review Wrestling. And again, Joe's getting the hair shot, a uh, headshot with a, ch uh, with a chair. We're going to take a look at Joe on a couple covers. He was an uh, icon in Montreal and Canada. <clears throat> also made his way through with AWA with Vern Gagne. A uh, couple of matches in the WWF. Uh, here he is um, with, uh, I believe it's Dory Funk uh, Jr. on the cover. It's Sports Review, May of 1984. Great bloody shot. Joe bled everywhere. The maniac axe man, the woodsman would come in. I remember watching a clip of him bringing an axe on television and he starts cutting himself on, the, on TV and, and his arm is, is gushing blood from the axe. <laughs> oh man, it was, uh, it's, it's, that's gotta be on YouTube somewhere. If you just look up, um, I don't know. I don't know what territory it was in. I remember watching it on the tape years ago. Um, March of 1975 on the cover, and superstar Graham of, uh, looking his biggest at this point. His arms were huge in this shot here of inside wrestling, March of 75. <clears throat> Another Joe bloody shot in Montreal. Uh, is Montreal the new blood capital? And uh, for sure, when Joe was in the match, he was getting bloodied up. Uh, here he is again. 
getting a finger in his mouth pulled across uh, wrestling bruiser Brody. And of course, we can't have a hardcore uh, video without mentioning Bruiser Brody for sure. Look at, let's just try to look at the eyes of this guy and tell me that's not the man, the look of a madman. Uh, what a great shot of Bruiser Brody on this program from World Class in 1987. <clears throat> it might be 88, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess you can look at the lineup sheet in the back. Um, May of 1987, uh, this was pretty much on its last few days of world-class championship wrestling. <clears throat> it would go out uh, maybe a year or so down the road. Um, but what a great shot, Brody reinstated. Uh, look, look at the forehead, you know, it's just like a pack of raw hamburger, the scar tissue. Oh, and speaking of, let's say hello to uh, Miss Barbara Goodish, the uh, Bruiser's wife, who uh, watched the Bruiser, uh, Rise of Bruiser Brody video that I put out. So uh, thank you very much. Very sweet lady and uh, very happy to have, a, have you watch that video. And uh, I'm glad I was able to highlight uh, Bruiser um, with, with some love and respect, especially uh, he was one of my favorite big guys as a kid. Um, but getting back to Bruiser, uh, on the cover wrestling scene um, with Carlos Colon and a great bloody biting shot. Carlos is bloodied all the way down to his feet on this issue inside the magazine. There's some great shots as well. Um, Bruiser again in the barbed wire. Again, this is Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico ha was known for these crazy wild gimmick matches. <clears throat> the barbed wire, the cage. <clears throat> uh, bled, you know, rivers down there. Brody is on the cover with um, Bam Bam Gordy. The bloodthirsty, savage, lunatic sheep herders. And they will always be known as the sheep herders to me um, until they became a cartoon caricature and a popsicle and a lunchbox under a different name. Uh, I'm not sure what their name is or was and won't even acknowledge it. These are the sheep herders and they were the most violent, brutal, bloody tag team of all time. And uh, here they are with the invaders in a barbed wire match. No teeth, gushing blood. Most of their matches covered with tattoos. Certainly the look of, of, of two men that you just do not want to walk down that wrong alley at nighttime and find them too. Um, again, with the Fantastics in the UWF and a barbed wire fence match um, from the uh, wrestling scene. Again, there's no friggin' date on it to tell you guys. It's issue number 47, if that helps you. Um, great coverage of the barbed wire match inside uh, this issue. This was also um, on television. I remember the barbed wire fence match and back when I had respect for Jim Ross when he was a good announcer in, in uh, Mid-South. <clears throat> um, Let's see, uh, now Puerto Rico showing the first fire match. Uh, Hercules smashing um, Carlos Colon's face uh, into the uh, fire, which were basically, there were towels that were wrapped around uh, wire or barbed wire, and uh, they lit them on fire. Uh, it was a lot more uh, successful than the, the FMW with the Sheik and Sabu's uh, fire match due to that being outdoors and that flame just got out of control. This was a little bit more tamed, but nothing like the stupid, ridiculous f fire match that I seen a clip of that the McMahon tried to do um, some years ago. I, I don't remember who the wrestlers were who were in it, but what an embarrassment. I mean, come on. Um, if there's no sense of, of danger uh, and everything's so controlled and confined, well, why bother doing it? It's just... Uh, absolutely re ridiculous, um, the attempt. Anyway, wrestling scene in Puerto Rico uh, with the fire. Now, <clears throat> wrestling from here was about to take a major change. Not about to, it already has. By 1988, it, uh, it underwent a uh, extreme change. Gone was the, the blood. Gone was the blood from the magazines. <clears throat> Gone was uh, any of the violence that went with professional wrestling, and it became... Uh, kid friendly and for that uh, Vince McMahon is is a genius for that and I got to give credit where it's due he's made millions by selling out he turned his back to thousands and thousands of people who loved professional wrestling and in exchange he gained millions of, upon millions of silly fans and kids who like to be uh, comedy and and silliness and fun and and cute uh 
and it, to, to us who were there from the beginning before it changed to that, um, it, it hurt a lot of us because now we had nothing. And some of us held on longer uh, than others in hopes that things would change. Because, you know, it wasn't like an overnight change, like bang, all of a sudden it's gone. Uh, it was kind of like, you know, like like the, the, the Nazi Germany taking over. It just wasn't one day, you know, everyone was wiped out. It was slow, subtle changes. We'll take away a little of this, take a little away a little of that. Now we'll take away a little of this. And then next thing you know, you're looking around, you're like, where's everything at? Where is this? Or what happened to that? And next thing you know, they cross the line and then they're sticking shit like this in your face and then really mushing the shit in your face by bringing it on silly little clowns and little comedy routines and stuff for children. It's kind of, this was like kind of the last straw. I have a lot of respect for Matt Bourne. It's a sign by Matt Bourne. I like Matt Bourne. I think this could have done really well and it did really well outside of the WWF. When he came to the ECW, they didn't stick with it, but they could have made that work. And Matt made a little bit of a career out of that on the independent scene with half of his face painted and half not. And that was pretty cool. I have a lot of respect for Matt as a wrestler and what he did here. I have no respect for the, the, the shit that McMahon was forcing down everybody's throat. And in 1993, 1994 was the lowest points for both WCW and uh, WWF because the fans were getting sick and tired of having their face pushed in shit. Therefore, they'd rather watch nothing. A handful of independents started popping up here and there and started doing some things that were a little bit different. <clears throat> Fans started watching some independents, some independent television. One day, a new company comes along called ECW. And... ECW <clears throat> was basically the fans who were on the resistance of the shit that was getting smeared down our throats. And because the fans were putting up a resistance, a revolution started. And the revolution was the ECW. The ECW was, was a pack in the beginning, was a pack of pissed off fans who were sick and tired of watching the garbage that was on TV and having their face kicked into it. We were the fans that loved the sport of professional wrestling, two guys going at it, treating it as a contest, treating it as a, uh, a, a, a we know it's not real, but you know, I know Batman's not fit, is, isn't real either, but I don't want to see him jump into a song and dance and do patty cake with the guy. You know, I just, you know, I'm going to suspend my belief. Don't insult me as I'm doing it. And that's what the WWF and WCW were doing. They were just, at that point, insulting uh, the fans. <clears throat> and being a part of early ECW, and that was in 1992. A lot of people say ECW started in 1993. And that, that's not true. They were around 1992, and I know it for a fact, because um, I, was a, I was a bouncer at a place called Delilah's Den, which is, was a strip club in Philly. Um, I was supposed to work at this shithole called Penn's Penn's Port Pub, who was, the, I was filling once in a while, and it was, the place was, it was a dump. It was the place where they swept the f teeth off the floor at the end of the night. Um, I was supposed to f uh, work there one night, and we happened to be in Philly early and meet a couple guys, and there's a sign outside the bar, and it says, Live Professional Wrestling Tonight, and it, has, and it had an arrow pointing inside the bar. I can't remember the name of the bar. Um, so we're like, fuck, let's go in. So we went in, and... Um, Dick Graham is there, and a bunch of guys are... I think we got there a little bit late, but it was just about ending. Uh, Dick Graham was the old announcer for the uh, Philly Spectrum matches. Uh, he was shit-faced drunk, really cool to talk to. We ended up having a great time. I said, fuck, I'm not going to go bounce tonight. Fuck that. I stayed in the bar, and uh, we stayed there all night. And I know for a fact, because it was 1992, and I was dating the girl from the, from the Pennsport pub, and that led into this big argument and a big fight. And call it fate or whatever the hell. Uh, it's a good thing I didn't go because uh, a fight broke out. A guy ended up getting killed outside. Uh, who knows if I would have been involved in that? Who knows where my life would have went? Uh, what direction it would have taken if something happened and I was involved in that? Um, I just thank, thank God that I didn't go to that bar that night and I and stayed with the ECW uh, and, and watched a handful of matches and got drunk with Dick Graham. So that's how I know it was 1992. 
they, they uh, it keeps everyone keeps saying 1993, but I mean it wasn't its its real core yet. It was still a small little thing, um, but it, it definitely started at 1992. Uh, and if it wasn't for the fans that that supported it, ECW would have been done. It wasn't nothing Paul Heyman did. It wasn't nothing Todd Gordon did. I'm not saying nothing, but if the fans didn't buy the tickets and you weren't putting out decent stuff, we weren't coming. And if you were copying the same shit that the two big companies were, were putting out, you weren't going to have us there. And it would have been folded like every other independent company did. So uh, early ECW w was uh, um, a breath of fresh air. Uh, when Shane Douglas... When they were following in the, in the footsteps of the NWA at the time, and I really wasn't thrilled about it because at that point it was just the belt. It wasn't really the NWA. It was just like the title and the name. Uh, the NWA was gone by that point, um, some five or six years before that, and it wasn't the same. And, but I was like, well, whatever. They're on TV. You know, Maybe they can make a comeback of it. And it wasn't until Shane, and I don't remember every word, but I'm going to remember in my head what I can remember. Uh, tonight... Um, I, I declare this the new era uh, the, of the ECW, the new era of the sport of professional wrestling, um, and uh, rest in peace, uh, NWA, uh, this, and this is the night they went to extreme. And it's also the beginning birth of the chant ECW, because it was never chanted like that until then. And that would stay until this day, even when they do reunion shows. They just did one back in November, and the chant is still going in that arena as strong as it was at this night, 1994, I think this was. Um, we knew when Shane threw the belt down and he made that announcement and, you know, we're pissed off, we're fed up, and, and we hear you, and we know what you want. Uh, and us, us wrestlers are pissed off just as much as you fans are. Uh, we knew it was something great and something starting that, you know, we were going to stick with. And uh, Shane really took off. I mean, look at the size of him here and when he was uh, the champion. And then now look at the size of him just a couple of years later. ECW now is on the map. On the map as in an independent thanks to the internet uh, that wasn't getting any magazine coverage hardly. We would see shots of Sabu on small little corners, but they would, wouldn't dare mention the name ECW on the cover. There was a few covers, um, I'm sorry, a few stories inside of these magazines, um, but nothing big, maybe an article or two. This would be the first magazine cover the ECW was showcased on July 1995, and it's got, it's assigned by uh, Sabu and Mikey Whipwreck. And um, so it took, you know, just a couple of years for the magazines to finally put them uh, on a cover, which rightfully so. ECW became uh, as awesome as it was because of guys like Sabu who, who you know, I don't need to tell you who Sabu is. You, you know, he broke every bone for you. You know, he bled buckets for you. He broke his, uh, his neck, his back, his arms, his ribs, you know, for a matter of $50 for you, the fans, could could come back again and see him the next night and to help the company grow. Um, the, the guy never got enough credit. The guy should have been a millionaire five times over for the for as innovative as he was and trend setting as he was. <clears throat> Another one was Cactus Jack Manson. Um, I know he goes by other names. I don't know what they are and I don't choose to acknowledge them. Uh, to me, he's always going to be Cactus Jack or Cactus Jack Manson. This is a really early promo. I didn't get signed, and I hope to get signed by him one day um, when he was wrestling the Independence and International Championship Wrestling. <clears throat> and uh, he, in the beginning, he went by Manson. Uh, I wish he would have kept it because he kind of looked like Charlie, uh, especially in this picture. Uh, this is before his accident for his tooth and uh, just a real old great shot of this old promo here. Cactus it doesn't need any introduction from me. Um, and I will for always... Always remember him as king of the deathmatch in the IWA in Japan, uh, which was one of the best uh, deathmatch companies uh, out there besides FMW. Um, Cactus, you know, everyone loves him. Everyone knows him. And I, I can't say anything that you don't already know about Cactus, uh, without a doubt. A legend and an icon, uh, minus the bullshit that he did uh, in the, that other company when he was acting like an asshole. Um, that doesn't exist to me. Cactus uh, signed photo uh, after winning the King of the Death match <clears throat> with uh, ba battling Terry Funk when 
Uh, Terry Funk was blown up by C4 Dynamite and his back got all fucked up. What a match. If you've never seen the King of the Deathmatch tournament uh, from the IWA, uh, do yourself a favor and try to find it. Uh, it's been bootlegged countless times. It's out there. I'm sure it may even be on YouTube. I don't know. Um, but uh, great matches with uh, Cactus and Funk. Um, Funk passing the torch to Cactus and, and him winning the, the whole tournament. Even though, I mean, they put their bodies through hell for a company that wasn't around much longer than a year after this tournament, if, even if that long. Um, IWA formed after Wing had uh, closed. Wing was an offshoot of FMW, another company of, of hardcore. We're going to cover a little bit of that in a second. But um, a real uh, a rare shot of Cactus. Uh, looks like he's wearing a mask at this point uh, from the IWA King of the Death match. <clears throat> I own two WWF magazines. Uh, one is the very first one with Hulk Hogan, and just because I had it since I was a kid. And um, actually, I think I own three, and I think I own issue number two also, uh, and this one. And it, it really it really killed me to buy this, but the only reason I bought it, and I will find a sticker to cover over that so I don't have to look at that symbol. Um, the only reason I bought it is because this these photos were taken from the photographers of Gong, a Japanese pro wrestling magazine, and these were Gong's photos that Vince McMahon bought the rights to, so they're not his. And uh, this is also covering the King of the Death match. I hate how they cut off his barbed wire bat here because he's carrying a barbed wire bat. Uh, the blood is gushing from his head. It's a great shot of, of Foley. Um, you know, Cactus, uh, I've, of course, you know, Mick Foley, I'll call him, but I wouldn't call him by his other names. Uh, uh, before he would go to the WWF and, and do all his shit, um, he, you know, this was the match that put him uh, on the map uh, and, and in the hearts of all the uh, hardcore fans out there. This has got great coverage inside. There's a great poster in here of him and uh, Funk, uh, Funk getting blown up in the barbed wire, uh, both of them gushing blood. Um, I would take it out and show you, but it's just it's it's like trifolded and it's too big and it's too clumsy and I'm I, I can't do it on a small uh, camera. Um, but uh, this is a uh, I just thought it was you know how rich is it of McMahon to now the guy who wiped all this shit out who took it all from us took away the blood and the hardcore here you are putting on Cactus Jack in Japan holding a barbed wire bat for the King of the Death match fuck you man you know I mean oh there's money involved in it well shit let me put it on the cover. There goes Jimi Hendrix making his appearance. Beat it, bud. Come on, dude. Uh, Raven on the cover of Pro Wrestling Illustrated, 1997. Uh, this will be your first time that the magazines are actually acknowledging an ECW champion and putting them on the cover of a magazine. And it's uh, on this issue, June of 1997. So it took about, you know, four and a half, five years to, uh, to get ECW on the cover and uh, there it is. At the time, it happened to have been Raven. <clears throat> Shortly uh, after that issue would be ECW's first pay-per-view, April 1997. I went to the arena. The, the line was wrapped around Swanson and Rittner and 15 other blocks down the street underneath the 95 overpass, and there was no way we were going to get in there. We know it. Um, <clears throat> but we hung out, I bought a program, we got drunk and we considered it like a, t uh, like a tailgating party and just hung out in line and bullshitted with the fans and, uh, just drank and ate and had fun and laughed and, and that was it. So it was more like a, like a, like a tailgating night, uh, for barely legal, uh, even though we didn't get in we still had a great time and it was on pay-per-view and all of our recorders were set to record it anyway. Um, due to the lack of coverage from any magazine or popular uh, publication at that time, ECW was hardly ever featured. Um, so, WOW magazine um, decided to cover ECW and put out their own magazine. And this was put out by WOW. WOW did a hell of a job putting out magazines. I think they outspent themselves and spent more than they brought in, but they gave uh, the fans five fantastic magazines. I'm glad I didn't subscribe to it because by the fifth issue, you could tell something was seriously wrong. Uh, the issues were thin. They were no longer, the th these had thick, uh, hard like book spines on the back here. Uh, they were no more like that. They were stapled. They weren't glued in like the, like the thick book. And um, hardly any content in it. I'm like, man, it's a good thing I didn't subscribe to this because I was about to do it. And, and the magazine folded. So issue number one had Taz on the cover. Great. F every uh, issue comes with uh, several posters that are trifolded like the Japanese do for us. 
and uh, it's 100% completely in, co in color, and almost any picture could be a pull-out uh, pinup. Actually, the picture of Cactus Jack was pulled out of an issue of WoW. So um, this is issue number two with Lance Storm on the cover. They only put out five, and I have all five. Uh, just incredible on issue three, talking about their pay-per-view anarchy rules. The next pay-per-view was um, November to Remember, Rob Van Dam on issue four. Um, Raven on the issue five. Oh, there's six issues. Okay, Raven's on the issue of five, and it's uh, talking about guilty as charged. Sabu finally makes it on the cover of a magazine, but is it really Sabu? No, it's the um, it's the arcade uh, game version of Sabu. Uh, still got the life like of him. Kind of looks like him, right? But nonetheless, it's Sabu. It just it's not really Sabu on the cover. Uh, this would be the last and final issue of uh, the magazine before it went out, and also. Um, ECW itself was about to uh, collapse as well. Um, I didn't, none of us fans seen that coming because the arenas were just as full as, as always. And it, it just sucks that the profits weren't going to the right place. Um, these were just some basic ECW uh, programs that you, you would get at the arena. Um, someone had asked me before if, the, if these were free. I think they were free. I don't think they charged. I don't remember paying for these. They were just three pieces of paper stapled together. You can see the staple in the corner. Um, this was, it doesn't even have a date on it, I don't think. And it, you know what it does? The lineup sheet's inside, actually. But these are all from Philly, uh, at, at, from the arena. Um, I'm not sure if they were like this in other ECW shows when they have them in other states. I would imagine that they were. Um, but this is three, four of them or so. Uh, this, I think, was like the last one I got. I think the last show I went to was in 98 or 99 when Taz just lost the belt. And that was like the last time I made it to a Philly show. Um, now this is just a signed promo by Sabu. Again, I can't say enough about Sabu and what he's done, and everyone knows it. Um, but before ECW and what they really rode the backs of, Paul Heyman wrote the back, basically, of FMW's uh, uh, blueprint. Uh, this is Onita. He is the founder of FMW. Onita was inspired to start FMW after an injury put him out of all Japan, and Baba cut him loose when he was originally an all Japan uh, young boy and um, said he could never wrestle again due to his injury of his leg. And... He wasn't having any part of it. He was, uh, he was trained and groomed by Terry Funk in the States. He would go on to Memphis and have some hardcore matches uh, in Memphis, which would lead him uh, to take that match from Memphis that he was involved in uh, and start a company uh, uh, like that uh, called FMW, Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling. This is an extremely rare publication. There's only a handful of these in circulation. And for me to have one, but that signed, I had to get rid of one of my kids, part of my kidneys, most of my liver. Um, but I, I finally made it happen. Um, this is probably the, the rarest magazine and hardest autograph to get out of anything I, I own. Um, uh, and I'm super lucky and happy to have it. A great magazine. It's too bad it wasn't around long. I can't pronounce it. I don't know how to say it. And like I said, it was only around for a short time. Um, but this is Onita on the cover. He was the founder of the hardcore style. Before he started it as a hardcore deathmatch style, it was a martial art and wrestling company. And it was looked just like this. This was, this was their original logo. It had the F and MW on the top with a guy in a boxing position. And they had martial art matches and they had wrestling matches. And the concept really didn't really fly that great. It was okay. Um, Dick Murdoch was their first American to, to come there to, uh, um, they were showcasing from the States. And um, it didn't take off. It, it, it did all right. This was this is October of 1989. This was a program from their very first tour, um, and their, within within the first couple of months, everything changed dramatically. This cover with the great Muda, and I'm trying to see the date here, uh, July, uh, September of 1990. Onita did something that was probably the most controversial, questionable thing anyone had ever done in the sport of professional wrestling. He went to Puerto Rico to get the invader, the man who murdered Bruiser Brody, um, to do an angle with him and to come to Japan and to, to battle uh, him in the FMW. What he did was 
he set it up to where uh, Invader attacked him in the locker room and stabbed him with a knife and tried to murder him and kill him. Onita staged all of it and put it, and it was released in Gong's magazine. And that started a whirlwind of shit. <laughs> this issue here is what basically, I mean, smart marketable because no one really knew who Onita was and what he was doing. Now the entire country of Japan knew what the fuck he was doing. Uh, he's on the floor getting stabbed by Invader. Here's Invader. Here's the fight. Here's where it broke out. Uh, here he is on the ground bleeding um, and getting taken away in the ambulance here. Very controversial, but genius to get it started. Rumor was they wanted to get Invader 1 uh, to Japan and the Yakuza, the Japanese Mafia, the Yakuza was going to murder him and kill him for what he did to Bruiser Brody because Bruiser was beloved in Japan, obviously. Uh, the Yakuza uh, loved Brody as well and they wanted his redemption. They wanted, they wanted this guy dead. Uh, uh, he got word that there was going to be a hit and he never showed. And then someone else said that um, he was banned from the country for doing this and he's never allowed to set foot in the country of Japan. Um, who knows? One of it's true, some of it's true. The truth is in the middle. Nonetheless, this is the most controversial uh, uh, tactic ever done to get publicity in wrestling and it's in this issue uh, with Muda on the cover of Gong, a separate volume, September 1990. Um, from that point on, FMW was off to the races with the most extreme barbaric matches ever presented to, a, uh, to an audience. And um, he knew he needed somebody big. He needed to with somebody who was feared. And his first person that he went for uh, was the Sheik. <clears throat> and the Sheik would go to uh, FMW. He would become the, uh, the champion. Of FMW, he would also beat uh, the Sheik for his U.S. belt. One of the very few people who who did that, even though the U.S. belt was already defunct by that point. Uh, still, nevertheless, in Japan, you know, a 65-year-old, 68-year-old Sheik uh, was still that deadly maniac that they read about in the magazines come to life. Um, you might get older, but your reputation and the allure of you is still there. I mean, you, that doesn't go away, and people want to see that. And people who never had a chance to see that are now seeing it. And he's just as mean and as bloody as ever. And here he is sticking the spike in Onita's face in a barbed wire match uh, when he won the title back. This is a issue, um, this is a program from FMW's second anniversary. I show this in another video, so I won't show it. It's got the Sheik and Sabu's first appearance in Japan, and this was for the, uh, the fire match, the controversial fire match that was stopped due to the flames getting out of control. And the Sheik had almost died during that match. He suffered severe burns. He was, in, he was hospitalized. They didn't think he was gonna make it for a short time. Um, all that is in his book, very interesting stuff. Uh, uh, from this issue, uh, this uh, program of 11-20-1991, um, uh, the second anniversary of FMW. This would be the third anniversary program. This is uh, more of the Sheik, the Sheik and Tarzan Goto uh, in another uh, event uh, in, uh, if, uh, in FMW. I have a bunch of programs, it's just a couple. Um, here is a very bloody Onita on the cover. Um, he, you know, like I said, things are about to get crazy with the uh, explosion matches. All the, everyone knows this history. Everyone knows all this stuff. Uh, if not, Dark Side of the Ring. If you can watch an episode of FMW, you get to learn a lot about Onita uh, and what his his plans are and what they were. And he's back, actually. The FMW is back. They had about six events already now. I think they had two of them this year already. Um, I checked out a couple of them. I really didn't care for them, to be honest. Uh, they weren't really that good. Um, here is an explosion match. Uh, Pogo on the cover. Um, 91. This is uh, May of 1991. And you can just see how over the top, you know, the matches are getting electrified. Uh, exploding barbed wire matches. Um, he would have several with everybody, such as Hayabusa, Tarzan Goto, Pogo. Um, the list goes on. Uh, of guys that he would take on in these death matches. Um, Hayabusa, Hayabusa, anyone, everyone who knows Hayabusa, he was um, 
more ripped off than anyone else, uh, as in style-wise, with the, the maneuvers he, he came up with were incredible. Um, he was also a great wrestler. And let me say this too, really quick. FMW had some great wrestling matches too. It wasn't just strictly death matches. And you think every match is barbed wire, every match is blood and gimmick tree. It's not. Uh, it was only the ones at the end, uh, the last match or the last two matches. Uh, the other matches were, you know, some pretty solid hardcore matches. And they had some great female wrestling matches as well. I don't have a lot of magazines with the females on the cover, but they really went at it, the females. They had some awesome death matches too. I mean, they bled buckets. Uh, a combat Toyota, even Manami Toyota was there towards the end of her career. Even, uh, they had some great female wrestlers there. Uh, but here is Hayabusa uh, getting three quarters of his hair burned off in a fire. Uh, we get the match blown off in his face. Uh, just missing him completely on the cover of Tokyo Pop. Um, this is just a, a great looking uh, a program of Hayabusa uh, when he won the FMW title. This is after Onita had, had left. He left the company and um, the new owners had taken over. This is a photo album uh, of all just color photos of FMW's matches. Uh, great, rare, hard to find uh, FMW Neo photo album. Um, if you can find it, here's just a shot on the back of, of the ladies wrestlers. Uh, like I said, they, they really had some awesome women's matches. This is an FMW program from the Golden Series 2000. This was Masato Tanaka, who won the ECW title from Mike Awesome, now defending the title in FMW. He was an FMW regular and uh, also FMW multiple uh, time champion. Uh, great looking program, the thing's enormous. Uh, Hayabusa would get uh, crippled in a, uh, in a botched m uh, maneuver um, going off, I think, the, either the second rope or the bottom, bottom or some rope to do a backflip and landed on the back of his neck and head and paralyzed him. Um, was never, never walked again. Started, I think, coming around, but slowly with a couple of steps here and there, but it was never actually the same. The poor guy, I mean, his career ended and uh, he ended up passing away sometime after that. This was his death issue in 2016, an extremely expensive issue. Uh, I got it for 20 bucks and uh, it was by a friend and by luck. Um, it sells well over a hundred every time you see it. So uh, it's a sought after issue in Japan. Um, it's a great shot of, of uh, Hayabusa. Uh, he loved Sabu. He took a lot of Sabu style uh, and it shows, but he also came up with his own stuff as well. FMW also branched another company called Wing, a couple of the wrestlers, just to keep it simple, uh, left uh, Onita and started their own company, Wing. Wing was another hardcore championship in, uh, uh, company in Japan. This is their first uh, this is their first program to their first event called Take Off, and it's just a, a program from that night. And there is the lineup sheet inside. I didn't buy this, this was also given to me Oh man, this lost power here. I just kicked back on. Sorry about that. If you heard that bang, uh, something happened outside. Um, anyway, this is a uh, just a Gypsy Joe. I'm still competing in 2000. I mean, holy shit, you know. Um, anyway, this uh, wing. It was a small company. It didn't last long. That would later be somewhat formed again to in another company called IWA. And we talked about that uh, with Cactus Jack winning the IWA King of the Deathmatch tournament. Again, that was only around for a couple of short years and then gone. Uh, this is a rare, uh, a ticket, a stop, ticket, to, unused ticket to an event for the IWA. It's got a Cactus Jack up here uh, in early 1995. Uh, the, also the Headhunters, Bam Bam Gordy. Um, uh, hard to find anything from the IWA. Uh, very, very difficult. I, I look all the time and hardly find anything. Uh, outside of the uh, Back to America, ECW spawned off a West Coast uh, company called XPW. XPW was had its moments. They had some good stuff. They had some bad stuff. They had, you know, shit in between. Um, all in all, I, I could watch it more than I could watch any WWF show. Um, again, I, I was a fan of some death matches. I, I, when it's done right and it's done well, I like it. I just don't like two idiots smashing light bulbs over their heads without any meaning behind it. I mean, if there's a good build up and there's a good uh, company behind it and it's, you know, funding it a little bit rather than just two guys in a backyard smashing bulbs in their head, uh, I can get behind it. Uh, XPW was without a doubt one of the better ones. Um, this was an early magazine slash calendar that they put out. Very rare. Also goes for a heck of a lot of money. 
XPW's champion, Supreme. I met Supreme in Philly. Uh, great guy. Um, became friendly with him, stayed in contact with him online, and a uh, rare autograph shot of Supreme as King of the Deathmatch champion. This company now has just restarted uh, a, a year or so ago, maybe a year and a half ago, and uh, so far, so good. The matches were excellent. Uh, Rob Black is doing a fantastic job with the rebirth of XPW. Um, I didn't see their very last show a couple of weeks ago. I'm about to get it pretty soon. Um, but, man, I can't say enough about uh, XPW and, and the great matches and the great uh, uh, performers and, and, and wrestlers that they have there. Awesome. Uh, just a crazy shot of Supreme with, like, 14 tacks in his head. Uh, unreal. Um, like I said, that would fold also and then also come back. Um, this is just a commemorative uh, hardcore uh, book. Uh, it's about 200 pages. Again, it's on the expensive side. It's from Japan. Uh, you don't need to read it to understand what's going on because the pictures tell it all. It's an excellent pictorial of all the hardcore matches and styles that took place uh, in Japan and also in the ECW, IWA, FMW, um, um, uh, Wing, ECW, XPW, all covered uh, in this uh, in this magazine that came out, uh, I think, five years ago, I want to say it was like five years ago. It's not a magazine, it's more like a book. Um, it's called the uh, Extreme uh, Wrestling uh, uh, Photo Book. And um, it, like I said, it's a little expensive, but if you're a fan of that, for the pictures and the shots, it, it's well worth it. So here is just a look back at how some of the hardcore extreme started and uh, in the magazines and the, the build up to it. Um, like I said, this isn't hardcore history. I was just giving you just some, some looks as it progressed uh, in the magazines. Um, and these are my opinions and they're, and they're just how I feel. Uh, I don't mean to bash anybody who's a fan of the WWF or the WWE, which I hate using those three letters. Um, that's that's fine. It's just me. I, I don't like it. I don't like what happened. I don't like how I had the sport that I loved stripped away and smashed. Uh, and it just it just left me with a hole. It had nothing. So you left me with no choice but to go with the further extreme and watch wrestling like this because there's no way I could tolerate uh, watching uh, that. Of course, everyone knows the Attitude Era and the NWO was all stolen from FMW's ideas and ECW's ideas. And, and it's just, it's so blatant. McMahon had the balls to put it on his own magazine. I mean, isn't that something? The guy wiped it out, took it away from us, and now, oh, well, look, look what I got here, here, buy this now. It's just the biggest fuck you ever. Um, but like I said, it's just, it's just my feelings on it. Uh, we seem to be getting a lot of new people hitting our channel, which is cool. Um, happy to have you. We, all I ask is just be respectful to everyone's comment or you'll be blocked and deleted. Not even going to go back and forth with stupid bullshit comments. Um, you'll just be gone. Um, I don't, I'm not here for, for likes. I don't care if you subscribe. I don't care. That's not why I'm here. I'm here just to show you guys some uh, cool old school wrestling stuff. This page was never supposed to get this big it was just supposed to be a handful of videos showing all the old issues and it just kind of because of you guys and your comments uh, and your requests it kind of just grown into this so um, you know how many more can we do it seems endless because I have so much material I'm just a collector I own every single issue from 1951 from the issue one until 1993 with the Stanley Weston issues and that's kind of where I stopped late 80s early 90s uh, and if there's anything that you're looking for, or anything that I can put a video out, I will certainly do that. I was asked about Jimmy Snuka and, and Nick Bockwinkle, and, and sadly, I would love to, but there's just not enough material with those guys to make a video. And they, they, it's a shame, too. Nick Bockwinkle was a great wrestler, a great champion, very underrated. He should have been on a hell of a lot more magazine covers, but it would be a five minute video if I did it. But uh, maybe I can come up with something and maybe do something else. But uh, uh, if there's anything you guys want to see, uh, I'll be happy to show it. All right, guys, we'll see you on the next.